Please open your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, please. Mark chapter 10, our lesson will be taken from a passage in that, uh, in that gospel. Interesting to note that three of the four gospel writers include um, a particular episode that must have been quite impressive to them because as you know, not every gospel writer you know, includes all of the information. Some talk about one event and the, another will skip that event and so on and so forth. But in this case, three of the four talk about the event that I will be uh, preaching on tonight. Um, and this would be, of course, the time when Jesus was approached by what we say, or what we call the rich young ruler. In the dialogue between Jesus and this man, we learned what an important influence money can have in our spiritual lives and how great the demands and rewards of discipleship really are. So there's kind of a multiple, uh, multiple lessons in this uh, particular passage. We also see that the wealthy are in fact poorer in God's sight than the poor because their wealth is a great obstacle in entering the kingdom that the poor do not have. The poor, there's one thing that's not in their way to get into the kingdom and that's money. That's, they have other obstacles perhaps, but money is not one of them. But the wealthy, they do have an obstacle. So there are a lot of good lessons I think for us in this particular in this particular episode. First, let's take a look at the story as Mark recounts it in his uh, gospel. Uh, chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. It says, as he, speaking about Jesus, he says, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So Luke, in his version of this episode, calls this wealthy young man a ruler because he was the leader of a local synagogue despite his, despite his young age. And so we see that he approaches Jesus with great enthusiasm, he runs to him, and great respect, and he kneels before Jesus when he, you know, when he gets there. And then he calls him good teacher, which actually was against Jewish custom and for which Jesus rebukes him. You know, only God was qualified as good. And this man did not really recognize Jesus as being God or as being divine. So for him to use that term in referring to Jesus was immediately breaking the custom and the law of that time. He also asks a sincere question which is at the heart of the human condition. And that is, what do I do to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do? Of course, the question reveals his problem. See, he thinks that eternal life is based on what you do, because he says, what do I have to do? And he wants Jesus to tell him the thing that he hasn't yet done, because he thinks that he's done everything and still he doesn't have eternal life. I'm missing something. I'm doing all the doing stuff and somehow I've left something out. Can you tell me what I need to do to inherit eternal life? So we have a picture of a young man who's very religious and yet still unfulfilled spiritually. So let's keep reading verse 19. Jesus says, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Now, we know that there are two ways to gain eternal life. One is to obey all the commandments of God perfectly and you have eternal life. Nothing will keep you, death cannot keep you, death could not keep Jesus, why? Because he had not committed any, any sins. So that's one way to have eternal life. Never break the law of God, never sin. And then there's the other way, have faith in Jesus Christ and receive eternal life as a gift from God. God, through the law and the prophets, had tried to show the Jews that they were incapable of keeping His law and so they had to rely on faith in order to have 
eternal life. Jesus asks this man a question to kind of draw out of him which way he was pursuing salvation. And by answering that he had obeyed all the commandments since the age of reason, meaning since he was a very young person, the man revealed several things about himself. First of all, the first thing he reveals about himself is that he had no idea of the demands of God's commands and how woefully short man's efforts are to obey them. In other words, he had no idea on how demanding the law really was because he says, oh, I've kept all the commandments. For example, he thought adultery meant you know, taking another man's wife, you know, because that was the classical you know, idea. You know, a married man taking another married man's wife. A Jewish married man taking another Jewish man's uh, uh, wife. That, that was adultery. He was answering it with that you know, mindset. And of course, God sees adultery as simply lusting after a woman in your heart, in your mind. Quite a difference, quite impossible for a lifetime not to have a lustful thought, an impure desire. And then it also revealed that he was seeking eternal life through a method of perfect obedience which he deluded himself into thinking that he had actually done. For example, he had already sinned by attributing to a person who he thought was a man a word only used for God. So in his approach to Jesus, he had already sinned. He had already broken the law. He had already you know, done something imperfect. So this man was seeking for the right thing with the right person, Jesus, but he was mistaken about his own condition and the way one could obtain eternal life. So let's keep reading verse 21. It says, looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. And so Jesus wants to give this man a kind of a reality check. So he gives him something, quote, to do. You want to do something? You want to go to heaven by doing stuff? Okay, I'm going to give you something to do which reveals the man's true weakness, his true sinfulness to himself. I mean, he was wealthy. So Jesus tells him to distribute his wealth to the poor and then come follow him in order to have eternal life. You see what's going on here? The young man is saying, hey, I've obeyed everything. I've, I've done it all. I've, I've obeyed all the commandments. And I still don't have you know, the eternal life, still not fulfilled. What am I missing? And Jesus doesn't say it actually, but he, he's kind of saying, you think you obeyed the law? <laughs> you think you're keeping the law? Uh, let me show you <laughs> what the law demands. And he asks him to do something that is clearly not something that he is able to do. So the young man comes face to face with something he cannot do because of his sin of greed or possessiveness, and these things just will not let him do that. So for the first time in his life, he's faced with the weight of the law, the crushing weight of the law, showing him that its demands are much greater than his ability to obey. Now he was at the point where his eyes could have been opened, he was close, he could have cried out to Jesus to save him because this demand was too great. He could have stayed on his knees and said, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm too weak, I'm too sinful. How can I obtain? You're asking me something that's impossible. Please help me, I can't do this. He could have said that. And don't you know what Jesus would have done? Jesus would have saved him, faith, would have given him the strength to do what Jesus wanted. And Jesus may have even given him back all of his wealth, now that he understood that salvation was by a process of faith in him and not a process of perfect obedience to the law. And so we read in verse 22, but at these words, 
he was saddened. And he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. He was so close, wasn't he? But it was not to be. His inability to accept Jesus. I mean, he knew who Jesus claimed to be, but he couldn't quite accept that. And he couldn't do the thing that Jesus required of him. And that left him, or less left him, to leave with tremendous grief and sorrow. Amazing how Mark even, you know, he gives us an insight into how the man felt. He was sorry, he had grief. Why? Well, he had grief because now he knew sin. Now he felt the true demand of the law. Now he realized that he couldn't obtain eternal life through obedience, but he refused to seek it by faith. Now he knew what the most important thing in the world to him was, not God, not eternal life as, as he had deluded himself into thinking. He found out the hard way that the real thing that he wanted, the real thing that was important to him was money, wealth. And Jesus had revealed this to him in their conversation. Had he at least tried to do what Jesus said in his mind, pursuing eternal life through a good work, he would have soon been forced to concede failure and found the mercy of the Lord drawing him to salvation through faith, not works. You know, if he would have taken the step, if he would have tried at least, and halfway through he, oh Lord, I don't know if this is too hard. I, I don't know if I can do this. Don't you know that the Lord would have encouraged him? But he didn't even try because he at once realized that his wealth was the most important thing in his life by far. So this brings us to the kind of, we always read this part, it's a familiar story. So this brings us to the second part of this story and that is what Jesus had to say about the rich young man and the choice he had made, because Jesus makes a commentary on what just happened to his, uh, to his disciples. So verse 23, we continue, it says, and Jesus looking around said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Ouch! <laughs> Ouch! You know, although I've, I've talked about various ideas of salvation and different approaches to eternal life, Jesus clearly states that the problem that this person had was money, not theology. His problem wasn't theological, it was financial. He even makes the general statement that rich people cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. This was and is hard to hear because there are many rich people, especially in North America. Let's face it, if we compare ourselves to the rest of the world, we're the rich. I mean, there are rich among us, but compared to the rest of the world, we're the rich people. So Jesus says that it's hard, as hard, for a rich person to enter the kingdom as it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. What does that mean? Well, impossible. And that's such a hard teaching. I've heard you know, uh, other ministers and scholars say, well, he didn't really mean that. He didn't really mean the eye of a needle. What he really meant was, well, you know, there's a doorway in the, in the wall in Jerusalem that they used to call the needle, and, and for the camel to go through there, he had to get on his knees, and they had to you know, bump themselves through that little hole. Sure, 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 sure. That's not what he said. It's not what he said at all. He doesn't explain why here, but in other places in the Bible, we get an idea why this is so. For example, he says that wealth causes conflict of interest. In uh, Matthew chapter six, he says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You see, 
the pursuit of wealth involves one person or a person in activity which is usually contrary to God's kingdom being established in one's heart. We're not talking about church workers here, we're talking about what's going on in your heart. The active pursuit of wealth, to be wealthy, works against the active pursuit to be a child of the kingdom of God. The wealthy must pursue wealth and give their total allegiance to it. And disciples pursue joy and peace and righteousness, souls, and they devote their times to this. Both of these things take time and love. And you cannot invest time and love into both of these at once. You got to choose. This is not a sermon about poverty being noble. This is a lesson about where your heart's going to be at, where your effort is going to be at. Another reason why the wealthy don't find the kingdom, the love of wealth leads to sin. You know, Paul says the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by a longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs, 2 Timothy 6.10. Notice what he's saying here. He's not saying money is the root of evil. I hear people misquote that all the time. They say, well, money is the root of all evil. No, it's not. Money is you know, amoral. It's just a thing. It's a tool. He says, the love of money. That's where the problem is. If that's what you love, you have a problem. For the young man in the story, the love of his wealth led him to reject Christ and the eternal life that Christ offered. You see, he was okay in the world, he was wealthy, and he was religious. And he was deluding himself into thinking that, well, I've done everything that God wants me to do. And yet he was unfulfilled. Why else would he have come to Jesus? Why else would he have come to the Lord to ask him, you know, what's missing in my life? I'm unfulfilled. You know, what, what do I have to do? And Jesus simply pointed to his wealth and he said, this is what you have to do. This is what's holding you back. It may not be holding this guy back. It may not be holding that guy back. It may not be holding this person back, but it's holding you back. Hasn't Jesus ever done that to you? Have you never had that experience? in your prayers, in your downtime, in your thinking time, even sometimes when you're just driving the car, the Lord somehow points something out to you. And what He does is He says, I'll tell you how it happens with me. You know, Mike, this has got to go. <laughs> but Lord, I've had this thing for a long time. I've kind of managed it, you know? Yeah, I know, but it's got to go. Or in my daily Bible reading, I'll read something. And instead of the reading being about the people in the passage, the reading becomes about me. And it's as if the Spirit of God is saying, okay, you need to step this up a little more. You need to try harder over here. You need to let this thing go. You need to erase those words from your mouth. Have you ever had that one? You need to erase that thing that you just said, that attitude that you just had, that thing that you've just thought about that person, you've thought it a thousand times and you know what? Time for that to go. That's what was happening to the rich young ruler. He had gone along for a long time having both of these things going at the same time. And Jesus said, you know what? That thing's got to go and he couldn't, he couldn't manage us. You know, most of us don't have as dramatic a fall, but the love of money leads to lying and cheating and killing. It leads to abandoning one's duties to family and church simply to make more money. It leads to desensitizing our conscience so we can permit ourselves to make or keep even more and more money. Haven't you ever felt tempted to cheat, to fudge on the income tax records? It's amazing what people will do. Never mind selling your soul for a fortune. I've seen people sell their souls for a hundred bucks. So it's easy to see if you love the Lord or if you love money more. 
Just measure the amount of free time that you invest in one or the other, or which one you drop when you have to choose. Then of course, this is a little more insidious, but wealth has a way of isolating us. You know, money enables you to create and to maintain your own environment so you can insulate yourself from the influences that you don't want. If you have a lot of money, you can send somebody else to go shopping for you. You don't have to you know, get in line with the rest of people. And too much wealth builds a wall between you and the voice of the Holy Spirit as well as the cries of the poor. Why is it that the rich man had Lazarus at his door and never heard Lazarus' cries for help. Why do you think? Well, he had a lot of people and a lot of walls and a lot of things between himself and Lazarus. So he didn't have to hear the cry for help. You know, the rich cannot see the kingdom because of the glitter of their own wealth. The list of reasons why, many, uh, why money rather, blocks the way to heaven goes on and on, but suffice to say that Jesus says that the wealthy can't enter the kingdom. Oh wow, yet I know, I know Christians, members of the church, who are millionaires. I mean, I know and I have friends who are millionaires and you know what the difference is? Remember, the difference is, is that they don't love money. <laughs> They've got money, but they don't love it. They love the Lord. I speak of him now, he wouldn't let me say this when he was still alive, but he's passed on now for, you know, for a while. Uh, Dr. Charles Branch, very wealthy, very successful neurosurgeon. You know, everything that money could buy, this man had. Success, everything he touched was a success. And yet he served as an elder for the MacArthur Park Church of Christ. And I can remember times you know, on Sunday night, the elders would be having a meeting you know, before church, 3.30, and he'd be running in you know, in his scrubs. He'd still have his scrubs from the operating room. So he could attend the elders meeting. And when I'd go preach there in Texas when they were you know, looking for a preacher and I filled in for a couple of months, he personally would drive me to the airport at 11 o'clock at night so I could take the plane back to Oklahoma to get back to work on Monday morning. He could, he could pay somebody to do that. No, he wanted to do it himself. Why? Because he wasn't doing it as the rich, famous, in his circle, neurosurgeon. He was doing it as the shepherd of the church. So yeah, he was rich, but he didn't love money. He loved the Lord and he loved the Lord's church. Let's go to verse 26 and 27, it says, they were even more astonished, now we're talking about Jesus' apostles when they heard what Jesus said, it says, they were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Well, you need to understand, the apostles are astonished at this teaching, and so should we be. And so they ask him in desperation, well then who can be saved? If the rich can't be saved, who can be saved? Because in Jewish society at that time, being wealthy was equated with God's blessing. So if the rich were lost, there was absolutely no chance for the poor to be saved. They thought if you were rich, it meant you were accepted by God. Jesus answers what he would have answered the rich young ruler if that young man would have taken the tiny step of faith and asked the same question. Jesus says rich people can't perceive the kingdom because of the burden of their wealth, but Despite this burden, God, through the power of the gospel, will call and will save those who come to Him in faith. Barnabas, for example, was he not a rich man? Did he not sell a piece of land and give it to the apostles, to the church rather? And Lydia, was she not a rich woman, a rich merchant? And yet, her heart was opened to the gospel. 
Yes, wealth is a great barrier to eternal life, a great cause of spiritual failure, but with God, all things are possible. Even overcoming materialism and riches to find and to remain true to the kingdom of Christ. Aren't you happy the apostles asked that question? <laughs> I am. And then he talks about the true riches. In the last part of this section, Peter begins to question Jesus about the fact that the apostles did what the young ruler failed to do. You know, they left, you know, Peter and his brother, they had a successful fishing business. They left that behind to follow Jesus. And so they say, hey, what about us? This guy, he didn't do it, he, he went away, but we followed you, we left and followed you. And so let's read verse 28, he says, Peter began to say to him, behold, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is a fair question that Peter asked. A lot of times he's just being impetuous, but this is a fair question. And Jesus gives them three things that their decision to follow Him will produce. First, an abundant life now. They will gain personal relationships that were lost because of their decisions. Church family usually is much larger and more satisfying than our non-believing earthly family. You know, Lise and I, we, we lost our earthly family when we came into Christ. I mean, you know, it's as if we had a disease, they thought we were sick. <laughs> you know, my mother said, bless her soul, my mother said, well, you know, I give it about two years and then you'll be back to your old self. And the last thing I wanted was to be my old self. <laughs> I didn't want to be my old self. And now you're my family. And for many of you, I'm your family. And we know that, right? Absolutely. And oh, what a blessing when our children are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, what a blessing that is. He also tells them that they're going to receive persecutions. God will supply family and support, but warns that the decision carries the threat of persecution as well. Sometimes it's from authorities or Satan's servants, but most of the time it's from the very people that you leave behind in order to follow Christ. They're the ones that hurt. They're the ones that denounce. And so that's another thing you get for following Jesus. And then he says, and then of course, there's this thing of eternal life. This of course is what the young man wanted and the promise that he makes to his disciples, that Jesus makes to his disciples. They have done what he refused to do and they, the apostles, will receive what he so desperately wanted but lost forever. Why? Because he couldn't let go. And then I'll read again verse 31. Jesus says, but many who are first will be last and the last first. And so his final encouragement to them is not to worry about the wealthy who seem to have you know, the best of everything and then they're, they're first always in all the situations of life today. Those who seem last now will take the first position when Christ returns. That's the other promise. So this is a very relevant teaching for our time and for society because, as I said before, we're the wealthy in the world. Wow, are you kidding me? You own two cars? You own a, a 1,500 square foot house? You're already richer than 90% of the world, right there, right there. You have indoor plumbing? You have hot and cold water on demand inside your house? You pick up a phone and, and, and call a doctor and can you know, drive over to the doctors within a day or two and have them take care of you. You can have the pharmacy deliver the medicine to you. 
Yeah, try being in a hospital in Somalia somewhere. Yeah, we're the rich ones. We're the rich ones. Of all the people on this planet, we risk the greatest danger of being blinded by materialism. Someone says, what's wrong with America? Materialism. Materialism. Could we still give up everything and follow Jesus if He called us to do that very thing? Would we follow? Could we? Or would we go away grieving? So let's not let our things or our pleasures stop us from following Jesus in the way that we know we should. Let's not allow the things we own to own us. Let's not allow the things we have to be such a heavy burden on us that we cannot do the work of the Lord. Let's not allow our desire for more things, shinier things, surer things, to blind us to the things that Jesus offers to us through His cross, through His Spirit, through His church. So if you hear His voice calling you to be a disciple or maybe be a more faithful disciple, to leave behind, not to give away your wealth. I don't think He asks people that specifically, but He might ask you to lessen your love for your wealth and increase your love for Him or his people, or the lost in this world.